Hello everyone! Since I recently finished Elden Ring, I thought it would be fun to talk about some random lore related thoughts I had. First though, two disclaimers. I haven't watched or read any lore related videos on Elden Ring, so this is all from my own interpretation. And second, major spoiler warning, so don't watch this if you don't want to be spoiled. My first thought with Elden Ring, and the main reason I wanted to make a video on it in the first place, is so I could talk about one of my favorite NPCs, D. Not only does D have a pretty voice, I'm known as D. I hunt down those who live in death. He also has one of the coolest looking armors in the game. Or in any game, if you ask me. I love it a lot. I think it's really cool. I think the appearance of Dee's armor relates to both the world of Elden Ring, Dee's beliefs, and Dee's own story. Firstly, the appearance of his armor relates to Dee and his beliefs about the Golden Order. The armor is made mainly of two colors, gold and silver. The gold could represent the Golden Order and the goodness Dee sees in it. So gold would be goodness and righteousness to him. While the silver could represent those Dee hunts. The evil of the world as he sees it. It is those who live in death, which he says are things which sully the guidance of gold. And the monsters you fight in the game that are those who live in death are colorless, things like skeletons, skeletal snails, and death birds. The gold and silver on his armor are intertwined, which shows that the Golden Order and those who live in death have become intertwined. And this could be backed up by the Elden Ring fandom wiki, which says hunters like D abandoned learning in search of an absolute evil to contend with. So maybe the people who believe in the Golden Order are leaving to fight the evil that opposes their belief. So they're kind of, you know, intertwined. But I think it goes deeper than that. If you think gold is good and silver is evil, then you could look at Dee's sword arm. It is silver and not gold. To me, this is symbolic. He has to do an evil act, killing to maintain the goodness and righteousness of the world and the Golden Order. And I think you could take this idea even further by looking at the sword he uses, the inseparable sword. It's made of both silver and gold as well. I wonder if this was intentional by the designers of the armor uh, or not. Either way, I really love the idea and I had a lot of fun just thinking about why it looks the way it does. But I don't think the genius of these armor stops there. I like to think it ties in with his story as well. The twin to armor description says that the two known as D are inseparable twins. They are of two bodies and two minds, but one single soul. Not once do they stand together, not once do they speak to one another. And the sword they use, the inseparable sword, says the inseparable twins found solace in the Golden Order, the only institution not to revile them as a cursed beast. So I think there's two things to take away from these descriptions. First is that they both believe in the goodness of the Golden Order since they took in the twins. And second, they had a falling out with each other since they don't stand together or speak to each other. So the gold and silver on the armor could be both D and his brother. In the beginning, I think the gold is D and the silver is his brother, who is especially white when you first meet him. And the silver and gold is both their bodies and minds, like the description says, but fused together in the armor to represent a single soul. Outside of that, the way D stands makes me think he wants to fix their relationship or he wants to protect his brother. I found that when D stands, he usually holds the silver figure up by its face, kind of like he's shielding it from seeing, even though the face has a blindfold. And when you meet Dee's brother, he's scared, so he does need some kind of protection and strength. And when Dee dies, his brother takes his armor, and I think the roles in the armor switch it. Dee becomes the silver person who's dead and can no longer hold himself up, while the gold is his brother, and he can now stand strong in gaining revenge against his brother's death. So that's my thoughts about the armor. I thought it was just fun to think about. <laughs> and now moving on from one of my favorite NPCs to another one of my favorite NPCs, my girl Ronnie. One of the things I found most annoying about getting to Ronnie was dealing with the pesky finger creeper hands around her. But when I got to thinking about it, I think there's an interesting thought to be had about their presence in the game and the location. First is their lore, which says they are born out of an act of blasphemy, which is from the ringed finger weapon. The act of blasphemy could be because of the cuckoo knights that attack the manor and whose souls are trapped within. I got that from the wiki, and I don't know much about it, and I don't remember much about it being said in the game, so I'm not entirely sure about that theory. But it could also be because of Ronnie's actions in the Night of the Black Knives, which led to, or was part of, the Shattering and the death of Godwin. 
And that's what caused Ronnie to die and move her spirit into the doll you see in the game. And all of this happened because Ronnie didn't want to be controlled by the two fingers. Regardless of why the finger creepers are there, because of the Cuckoo Knights or the Knight of the Black Knives, I think it's interesting and kind of ironic that a bunch of hands are around her, hands which control puppets and dolls, and hands which have at least two fingers. <laughs> Ronnie wanted to escape being controlled and ended up being around a bunch of hands anyway. And I wonder if the other gods or demigods found humor in that, or if it's just a coincidence that I'm drawing some crazy conclusions here, but it's something fun to think about. Now on to another character I liked. Okay, I liked pretty much every character in this game, Selen and the Crystals. I really loved Selen and her questline, even though the Academy story kind of confused me because there's some kind of hierarchy going on there, but I still had a random train of thought when it came to her story. While I was looking at Selen, I noticed that she had a little bit of a crystal on top of her mask. It's similar to the other masks in the Academy, but I thought it was more prominent than those. And this made me think of the two guys you have to find for Selen, Azur and Lestat. They both have prominent crystals overtaking their heads and bodies. Both of their helmets have similar descriptions that their gems replaced their brains and skulls altogether. And if they are removed, it would kill them. If they remained there, would the crystals have overtaken their full bodies? Continuing off their descriptions, their armor says that they were driven from the academy and no one has achieved their formerly held rank. And since Selen has more of a gem than the other students at the academy, I wonder if she was close to achieving their rank. And if she was, would she have turned into a crystal too eventually? Maybe that's the cost of too much knowledge in glintstone magic? Or maybe that's where glintstones come from, people? But I do think Selen says that glintstones are from stars, so maybe I'm just drawing weird conclusions here. But I was just thinking about it, like why do Lustat and Azur have so much crystals on them? Since she ends up turning into a ball of masks at the end of her story, this whole thing makes me wonder if she was doomed either way. She'd become a gem or she'd become a ball of masks. Either way, she girl bossed a little too hard. <laughs> Next up is one of the boss battles I was most excited for in Elden Ring, the fight against Godfrey. I saw a few clips of this fight on TikTok and none of it compared to actually fighting him. One of the things that stood out to me most in this battle was the second phase, where Godfrey takes his lion Sirash off. When I first saw this, I thought he was evening the odds between us because Sirash is kind of ghostly looking and when he goes to remove him, you can see him take his physical form. So I thought Godfrey was like taking off his godhood to become a human and fight us on even ground. I think it's kind of the opposite of that, but also kind of not the opposite. Godfrey's icon says that Sirash was on his back to suppress his ceaseless lust for battle. So him taking off his lion doesn't downgrade him, it kind of upgrades him and allows him to take off the limiters he has in battle while also allowing him to feel the full emotions of his fight. And he gives you his name, Horolu, instead of Godfrey the First Elden Lord, and that made me love the fight even more. He's giving us the ultimate form of respect. It shows how worthy we are to fight him, and it's awesome to see how far we came. <laughs> And finally, speaking of final final battles, is the big reveal of Radagon and Merica. Was it not like super cool to see Merica turn into Radagon in the final battle? I had to go back and rewatch this scene just to make sure my eyes were seeing it right. I remember being kind of confused when it was revealed to us in Gold Mask that Radagon is Merica, but now I get it. And so I went back to rewatch the first cutscene in the game, and they show her turning into him there too. And I thought that was really cool. It was right in front of us all along. Anyways, those are all the random lore related thoughts I had about Elden Ring. Again, this is all from my own perspective and understanding of the lore. I was having a lot of fun thinking deeply about the intentions of the art and story, and it was fun connecting the dots myself. If you like Elden Ring and you have anything else to add, I would love to hear it. Thank you for watching.